Welcome to The Cutting Edge with Dr. Lee Pearson, Dr. Robert Stubberfield. I'm Steve Richens. And on today's show, we have two special guests again, and we have a continued top topic, so psychoepistemology as child's play. And sorry. And our special guests are Dr. Harry Benzwanger and Jeff Frinkel. So I will turn it over to Lee. Okay, thanks, Steve. Um, now, when last we met uh, two weeks ago, uh, Dr. Benzwanger, I'm going to go with first names, right? Harry. Um, uh, heroically arrived with his with his uh, cell phone and his flashlight, uh, but he was uh, actually still cut off. Eventually, his internet was cut off completely, so we didn't uh, we didn't get to hear all of his uh, suggestions about about uh, children's games, psychoepistemological games. So I thought we would continue and start off with Harry this time to continue on that topic. You might want to just start over because we you barely started. You mentioned Simon Says, I think. Yeah. And but you uh, said you would that? review what you said about <laughs> introspection because I didn't oh. hear. Well, uh, okay. Okay. I'll say a few words about it. I'm going to say a little about that later, but I guess a little bit now it wouldn't hurt. Uh, I, I think introspection is the, the key skill of psychoepistemology for everyone, uh, or in, specifically introspection on thinking. I mean, I think introspection on emotion is important but it's not as much highlighted uh, as introspection on thinking. And I think introspection on thinking is the real fundamental skill. Why? Because you need to do that to properly direct your volitional action, your volitional attention. There's an intimate relation between introspection and volition. Uh, once you understand, and it's very crucial to understand what, is, what, is under, what, what we have under our direct volitional control. What do we directly volitional control? Well, I say, following uh, William James uh, with some additions, uh, that what's under our direct control is the conscious mental effort of attention. And uh, you can always exert more uh, effort, and the, the, but it's important that the effort of attention be directed to the proper object at any particular time. And so that's why introspection is important to identify uh, usually uh, uh, what you're uh, attending it to in a thought process is conceptual content. And uh, often you need to get your attention narrowed to specific concepts to activate the knowledge you need to uh, keep your thinking going. So a lot of introspection, in my opinion, uh, needs to be devoted to identifying what key concepts what to think about next, where to direct your attention to best facilitate the progress of your thinking. And that's a skill. And, and I'm saying, uh, we were discussing this last week, but I don't know exactly what age uh, that skill can be uh, taught, but we find out by trying to teach it. So Jeff is very important in this. He's got this bright young child who's just about, is she still six or is she in college by now, Jeff? I mean, <laughs> no, she's six and, a, yeah, six and a half. So kind of six involved. and a half. She's getting old fast. We got yeah. to get to work here to find out what, at what stage is it possible to, uh, to teach what things. Now, Harry emphasized the importance of hierarchy in the instructional process. You have to teach the concepts in the right order. And, and I think that's true for skills too. But you find out, I mean, it, it's not a disaster if you, teach something out of hierarchy and, and it doesn't work. It just means you have to go back and, and try something simpler. So I, I think uh, we don't know. I don't know exactly when we can teach a sk a what skills at, at what age, but we, we can certainly find out or Jeff is going to find out by trying to do so. And um, so in introspection, I think, is the fundamental skill. I have some reason to believe it can be taught at pretty early ages, uh, certainly by, say, eight there is actually some interesting developmental research from years ago that's, that uh, found that eight-year-olds have about as much knowledge, well, this is a little exaggerated, have, have a lot of knowledge, nearly as much as cognitive psychologists do about the nature of their memories. They know all kinds of things about their own memories. And so uh, they have an introspective, uh, they must have done some introspection in order to acquire that knowledge. 
it, so that's eight year olds, but I think it can go back further. I think there's reasons that they can go back maybe even to four or five or something. I don't know. You try it. And I'm not sure all kids uh, that this is a lockstep um, age uh, specific uh, development that may be for some kids can do it earlier than others. So I have a few other, th- I have some other things to say about introspection, but why don't I just stop there for the moment, turn it over to Harry and let him talk. And then uh, Jeff is going to discuss and then I'll come back in and then we'll, you know, get into a general discussion. So thanks for making it here again, Harry. Uh, this time you don't have to go to such heroic, uh, with such heroic measures, uh, I hope. And uh, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Lee's suggestion of teaching psychopistemology and introspective skills to young children uh, was his own idea. I never thought of that and immediately realized this is a gold mine. And uh, if somebody wants to make a business of providing the kind of things I'm saying, there might be real money in it. Uh, See me for a cut before you do that. (laughs) <laughs> so the uh, uh, I am not too concerned about experimenting on uh, on children because I remember my own childhood, and um, as Lee says, it's not nothing bad. It happens if you try something and it's too easy or too hard for the kid. You adjust accordingly, but. Um, Let me tell you the categories of things I want to teach through some actual discussion with the children and some games. I want them to know that they have a mind. In other words, self-awareness, self-consciousness, I have games for that. Then imagination, that there's an imagination and that it's different from reason, which is the next thing. that they need that imagination is not a source of truth, but reason is. And what uh, obviously I'm putting in more abstract terminology than you would in discussing. And I'm just telling you, as the potential educator of a child, the category free will. You can help them see that they have free will and what it consists of. Emotions, uh, what they are, why they have them, and finally logic, which is for the oldest kids, and I don't mean anything as sterile as either symbolic logic or regular Aristotelian logic. I mean certain techniques of using their minds that they can become aware of uh, in, by introspection. And you'll see all these when I concretize them. So first, self-awareness. It has to be a discovery that they can say things to themselves that others don't hear. I think this probably is learned about four, three, four or five in that area. So I thought if you had a class, you have them sing twinkle, twinkle, little star. And then you say, now this time we're all going to sing, sing it in our heads quietly without you know, moving our lips, well, maybe that's too demanding, without uh, saying it out loud, and then try it and see when they can start doing that. And then you can, when they can, then you can point out a number of things, such as, so you talk to yourself in your head. It's not just this singing, don't you... Talk to yourself, say things inside your head silently all the time. And others can't hear that. So that's called your thinking. And your thinking is private. Well, they wouldn't know the word private. Other kids and other adults cannot hear what you are saying inside your mind. And then I could uh, think of games uh, to do that, like you have it fit in with a a values exercise. You have Johnny pick his favorite flavor of ice cream and say it to himself inside his head. And then you ask little Linda, no one's named Linda anymore. um, Little Asante, 
what did what did Johnny just pick? Did you hear? He said it to himself. I don't know. Or it was vanilla, but you know, he's just guessing. And he has to learn the difference between guessing or not. And then you could say, you know, well, Johnny, try harder. Say it louder in your mind, but don't say it out loud. And of course they can. So you could have some exercise to concretize that. Uh, another thing is, where are you when you're asleep? Um, and they might say, well, I'm in dreamland. And you could, you know, that's a rich feel. Where do things go when you shut your eyes? These kinds of questions can help them grasp that they are conscious. Uh, for after these first basic things, I think a very, very helpful exercise is a game based on uh, freeze. You know the game freeze where you have a move about and the teacher yells freeze and they all have to stay in the position that they're in until she says, okay, now start again. And kids like that because it exercises the capacity that they have. And, all right, so suppose there's a game like freeze, but it's for thinking. And the teacher says now, or whatever it is. And the kid has to tell what was just going through his mind. What were you just saying to yourself? What were you just looking at? What were you just feeling? Uh, you know, various degrees of um, difficulty. What you're just feeling being the, uh, were you just feeling, my answer might be nothing. Uh, and it's a hard, a much harder question, but what were you just saying to yourself? And the teacher has to wait long enough so that things will start to go through their minds other than that, but it'd be, uh, putting them in touch with the fact that they're thinking. Now, under imagination, there are certain obvious things like picture a beach ball. Can you picture a beach ball? Now, what if it's you know, being thrown by a giant? Can you picture a giant? Well, that's going on inside your mind. That's imagining, that's pretending, that's making up. And then you can teach them the distinction between real and made up through a story game. You could have a game where uh, one of the kids in turn will tell the story. And it's one of two kinds of stories. It's something that really happened to him. You give him a, you know, talk about what, what you had for breakfast or what, I don't know what it would be. Um, last time you, you saw your mother or something. And they're told you can either tell what actually happened or you can make up something that didn't happen. And the rest of the class has to guess what, which one it is. There's, there's no point, you know, except that maybe if it gets too outlandish, you know, a giant swan swooped down and picked up my mother, then they should learn that that's made up but just that, that people can make things up and you can make things up. And that's not the same as what's real. Uh, and then that gives rise to the issue I'm calling reason. When I, um, and this is based on the story of myself, when I was four, I was washing my hands and it suddenly occurred to me, suddenly popped in my mind, if you dried your hands without rinsing them, you couldn't catch a cold. And I ran excitedly into my mother to tell her about my great discovery. And I told it to her and she very gently said something like, uh, I don't think that would work. I don't, I don't know what she said, but I remember thinking, oh, so just, because it came to me doesn't mean it's true. <laughs> and that's a discovery. And when you're four, you know, that's an important thing uh, to know that the mere presence of an idea in your mind, something occurred to you, doesn't give it any particular proof value. And you could have a game, a prove it game, 
which is that uh, a person, uh, one kid would say something, make an assertion, and other people would say, prove it. And if he could prove it, and I'm not exactly sure how you would do that because it has to be very simple. Um, then he wins a point. If he, he can't prove it and he's challenged, then they win a point. Now we're about halfway through. Free will. Free will can be uh, thought of as there's things you do and things that happen to you. In your mind, once you've got the idea of the mind, the things you do with your mind, those are the volitional things. And the things that just come to you, that happen to you. So you could concretize that for the kids by saying, um, twinkle, twinkle, little. Did you hear a word in your mind? Now, this assumes they know the song. You have to pick something that can't be mistaken. Yeah, I heard star. Okay, now, what did you have for supper last night? And, you know, there'd be various degrees of searching to recall that. And if they get it all, get it right away. And he said, how about the night before last? And you concretize for them the recall that's prompted by a stimulus from the outside world and the effortful recall that they have to do. Uh, there's other games, particularly those that um, are coming up in the emotion section because emotions just happen to you. They're not things you do. You don't, you don't say, oh, I... I did anger. I angered. No, I got angry. So under the emotions, I would ask them, what could make you feel happy? Now this, I'm thinking now a five-year-old, what can make you feel happy when it happens? What makes you feel sad? And you, they give some answers. What can make you feel sad? Now, the goal is to not to um, understand things that can make you happy, but that emotions have causes, so they turn it around. I'm happy now, so what was it that made me feel happy? I used to wake up uh, in the morning sometimes with a very expectant, very optimistic attitude, something good is going to happen today. And I would always ask myself, well, what is it? What good is going to happen today? Sometimes I could find something, but a lot of times I couldn't because I was too young to know life is good. Anything good can happen to me today. So what can make you feel proud? What can make you feel guilty? That's about as abstract as you could get with a five or six year old. There's another thing that I was actually assigned in junior high school, I think, uh, which was cut out magazine photos of people experiencing the following emotions or cut out magazine. No, they said cut out magazines that expressions on faces that show emotions and tell what emotion they have. And the reason I remember this was that there was one face which is very definitely had a certain emotion on that. I didn't know how to describe it. So I asked my father and he said, consternation. And that was a word I sort of knew. And I was impressed, you know, hey, this is a pretty big, exciting word. Uh, so I remembered that exercise because I liked the big word that was used to name it. <clears throat> but the goal is to get them to know what emotions they're feeling when they're feeling it and what possible causes there are. Now, you can also classify them. My wife has, Jean has a classification of eight basic families of emotions. 
And those could be taught to the kids. All right, now we get to logic, which is um, interesting, I think, and more interesting for adults. Uh, that is for us as um, administering them and playing with the kids on it. The simplest one is name the opposite. What's the opposite of black, white? What's the opposite of in, out? What's the opposite of up, down? And you go, then you get, you know, harder and harder. What's the opposite of tired? Not tired. Well, yeah, but is there a word for that? Energetic, they wouldn't know. Active, uh, bustling. And, you know, they could come, that would be a kind of hard one, wouldn't it? I just grabbed for that. But kids, a no normal kid would feel pleasure at identifying the opposite. It brings order into his cognitive equipment. And then you could turn around at a, after, you know, they get a little older. Is there something that the black and white have in common? Now you're going for the genus here the wider category that the differentiations within. Color, uh, or in or out, position, tired or active, uh, I'm not sure. Activity level, that's, that's a, hard, a hard one, I didn't prepare. Um, and of course, there are many things that don't have opposites. Like what's the opposite of man? Now, if they say woman, I mean, human being, what's the opposite of human being? What's, there's no opposite to most entities. What's the opposite of a table? But you have to take out, you could teach them that. There's a difference between things. Things don't have, objects don't have opposites. But what we call attributes, or which is what, what would they call them? Qualities of thing. I, I don't know. You have to find the simplest word. Maybe you don't even get you say what it is. The parts of what it is may have opposites, and you, you're moving them to a very abstract understanding of the metaphysics of reality. Now there could be a game where. It, let me back up. The opposites are very important to use in your thinking. When you think about something, you need to know as opposed to what. So I thought of a game, the as opposed to what game, but it wouldn't be called that. You tell a story, the teacher does, and stops at various points. Uh, like uh, there, there was a prince as opposed to what? And then they would say a different kind of office. Who opened his door as opposed to what? I mean, you know, I'm stopping very often. Uh, as opposed to standing still or as opposed to not being able to open, the, you know, it doesn't matter what they give. The, the point is uh, to get them thinking in terms of differentiation. I, uh, the prince went out and, and went for a walk as opposed to what? Staying where he was. Now, these, they're not any one answer unless you make it, you set it up to be one answer. So uh, that, that something you teach, you'll give me several as opposed to what. Then when they get really old, 11, you can teach some Mills methods, but really the method of difference and um, the method of agreement, you know, really doesn't come up very often. Method of difference, the method of concomitant variation. And you could teach it in terms of when technology fails. There's probably other good ways to teach it too, but it, I use it all the time when, uh-oh, my monitor doesn't turn on, okay? You look at the parts of it, it does, it, does the, uh, are other things turned on? 
using the same circuit, yeah. If I replace the cable, will it turn on? Yeah. Oh, so that must be the cost. If I replace the cable and it comes on, then it's a bad cable. So you know how to do this troubleshoot by changing one variable at a time. Finally, I would tell them the story, literal story of the crow. It's something a child of 11 can appreciate. And the lesson of it is the need to condense. Um, and there are all kinds of puzzles, at least and there's a hundred of them, where there's a moral, uh, which is that there are things you can use to, con to know what the next question to ask is that unlock the doors. I'll leave you with one. This is the end. Of, <clears throat> um, a man has to drive a truck of apples through three toll gates. The toll at each gate is half his apples plus a half of an apple. He goes through, as he exits the last toll gate, he unfortunately has zero apples left. How many apples did he start with? Now, you can do it in your head if you know how to do it, if you know the trick. If you don't, you sit down with the algebra, it becomes mind-numbingly complex. I remember I didn't think of the right way to do it, and I had several pieces of paper with formulas within formulas. So if you start with, well, T, let's assume T is the total number of apples he has. After the first gate, he has t over two minus a half. And after the second one, he has that uh, over two minus a half. And at the, you know, you're going to lose your way. It's recursive in that way. Work so backwards. This, yeah, that's the answer. You work backwards, you, you get it really easily. You, I'll leave that to the reader because I've talked to them. So the idea is make it fun and teach them the opera, teach them they have a mind that they're thinking, they're feeling, they have free will over doing things with their mind, and then here's some good things to do. Oh, I didn't mention another game, 20 Questions. It's a very good game, logical game for the somewhat older kids to play. It uses their conceptual structure to isolate something. And uh, in a way, it is also Mill's method. Okay, I'll stop there. Actually, you know, let me take before I turn it over to Jeff, let me, because I, I want to bring up a couple of questions for Jeff to think about and just uh, quit some quick comments. Uh, maybe working backwards. Working backwards is a good thinking technique, but I, I would uh, actually generalize and say at some point you want to start teaching kids uh, a whole list of heuristics. Working backwards being one, but here's another, another big one that I know fairly young children can learn. And in fact, this was a young child named this one for me. The young child called it thinking in small terms. Well, that was, I guess, about a 12 year old. Thinking in, so when you have a complicated problem with big numbers, work a similar problem with smaller numbers, with small numbers, and that'll give you, often give you a, a handle. Anyway, there are a whole bunch of heuristics that are, some of which are covered in the classic book, How to Solve It by George Polya. And uh, most of those, I think, can be taught to kids. Again, it's another one of these things. At what age? Don't know, but you try them. And, and if you have a lot of these heuristics in your, in your uh, um, quiver, I guess is the analogy, uh, you, you, know, you can solve a lot more, uh, uh, many more problems. And speaking of analogy, oh, we, speaking of analogy. I left, I left one out that I said, oh. like, the Simon says, can I just briefly cover that? Because that's for sure. four-year-olds. For yes. four-year-olds, you play the game Simon Says, but you draw the lesson, you know how it goes. Uh, the teacher says, if, you, if I say Simon Says, do so-and-so, you do it, like, and then you practice it. If I just say do it, then you don't do it. And kids, you know, mess up. If Simon Says, put your hand on your head. Simon Says, put your hand on your chin. Simon Says, wave your right hand wave your left hand and half the class will wave their left hand. So you teach them, 
if you want to win at this game, you have to keep saying in your mind, Simon says, as a question, did she say Simon says, keep that alive in your mind, that those words, and you won't mess up. Yeah, goal, goal directedness, you're, they're learning from that. Yeah. Um, okay, so another thing that, that uh, just occurred to me while you were talking, Harry, you mentioned the game with uh, opposites. And it occurred to me that that's actually a specific case of a more general class of what I think would be very useful games that I'm going to call analogy games. That uh, op- same and opposite as one. Uh, part and whole, you give a part and ask for a whole, give a whole or ask for a part, cause and effect, uh, bigger versus smaller. If you give a bigger object, ask for a smaller one, no similar object. Broad and narrow in category, give a broad category, ask for a narrow, or give a narrow, ask for uh, a broad. I guess, th- anyway, there are a number of analogy relationships. I can't list them all right at this moment. But, but any of those things could form the basis of a game. And analogical reasoning is very and uh, valuable to learn. I mean, I don't, again, I don't know what age uh, I'm going to turn this over to Jeff in a moment, see what he thinks, but I would say analogy games could be extremely useful. Uh, Harry brought up some of these um, contrasts that kids need to learn. Uh, for example, real versus made up. And I'm, I'm wondering if Jeff can tell us something about his, uh, his youngster, uh, what she knows about at this stage, as I think probably kids learn that pretty early, but I don't know. I'm going to ask him see what he thinks. Private versus public, in your head versus spoken out loud. What, what it, kids certainly learn that. Um, what age does that usually learn? It's important. It's a really important thing to learn. Uh, here's another reason. Uh, you, uh, my favorite line in world literature is, uh, there are no evil thoughts except one, the refusal to think. That's Francisco Danconia. And uh, uh, the point is that, that you can think about anything and you shouldn't have to worry about other people hearing what you're thinking. I, I, I think all kinds of stuff. I don't necessarily want to have everybody else in the world to, to be uh, tuning into what that is. It would be really bad if, if there were universal te- telepathy in the world. That would be a, probably a horrible thing, I think. So that issue of privacy is actually quite, quite important. And then there's a related issue to that issue of the, that, um, oh, oh no, the, the issue that Harry brought up of uh, just because something is in your mind doesn't mean it's true, which is an important, is an important thing. Again, I don't know uh, when kids typically learn that, but they have to learn that. Uh, maybe, you know, some people never learn that, I guess. Uh, <laughs> but uh uh, it, uh, another corollary or, or related important thing to learn is that just because something appears in your mind doesn't mean that you have to believe it. You don't have to believe it just because it shows up in your mind, because that is, again, related to there are no evil thoughts. You can think about all kinds of stuff that might be true, might not be true, but you don't you don't have you should not be worried that if you think of something that you're going to have to believe it just because it shows up. And the same thing with emotions. You shouldn't be concerned with if some emotion, you feel something, you have to act on that feeling. Right. And so that, uh, you know, to, if you have that wrong idea, that will inhibit your thoughts and your emotions, both of which is a horrible, horrible thing. So I'm curious about how much uh, Jeff's daughter, I, I think he told us her name and I've forgotten already, but uh, he'll, he'll, he'll uh, come back to that. So let me just... Uh, I can bring, I'll bring up some other things later. Let me stop there and see, see what Jeff has to say. Hi, Jeff. Yes. Hi. Well, this is um, <clears throat> quite a very, it's a very interesting conversation. And as, as you guys were, um, you and Harry were going through, um, you know, the different topics, emotion, logic, I'm thinking back to, you know, just at what level my daughter, her name is Emma, or Emmanuel was actually her long name. We just call her Emma for short. Um, you know, as, ever since she can, I can remember, you know, as, as objectivists, we're acutely aware of, uh, you know, the method of thinking. And so I've always been, uh, even before I was, it was explicit, it was implicit that I want to kind of train her mind to be aware of reality, be aware there's a difference between real and imagined. So 
I would always point out, if we're, even if we're walking on the street and she'll see something, I'm like, you know, just even, I can't even, there's so many examples I couldn't even tell you, but it's always on my mind to, to grasp her thinking in reality, right? And then to contrast that with imagination, um, one example I can, I can off the top of my head is um, that just wanting something doesn't make it happen. She'll say she wants a toy or something. And I said, well, do we have it here? And she says, no. I says, well, how do we get it? And she thinks about it. She's like, and then she thinks about it. And she says, well, we have to buy it. I'm like, well, how do we buy it? We have to do something, right, to get So all these things, are, like the point is that things don't just happen because we want something or because we wish it to be true. And I, and I do that probably like 10 times a day. I can even give you examples. And, and eventually she's starting to, to pick up on that. And she'll she'll preemptively say, you know, she, she, does, she, doesn't, she knows essentially that wanting something doesn't make it happen. She wants to, she wants to build something. She has to do it. Um, you know, just, just by nature of our interactions and I'm always kind of cognizant of, of how I'm explaining things. And I'm asking her, you know, am I clear on things, these, these things. So, you know, it's so much, it's kind of, um, you know, it goes back and forth all the time, this dialogue, almost like a Socratic dialogue. And then, um, you know, especially the other thing that I really wanted to, to hone in was Harry, well, it was the opposite game. Um, I've been doing that for a little while with her and, so hot and cold is a good one. We'll, we'll uh, you know, find, I'll stop her exactly what Harry was saying. I'll literally stop her. And, you know, I'm, I teach content with her. So I, I homeschool her. So we'll be doing something. Um, we were doing something in um, on why rivers flow, you know, and how they flow downhill. They start at a higher elevation. And then I'll, I'll immediately contrast, well, what doesn't flow? And then she'll say, she'll say a puddle. And I said, well, you can see where the puddle is. It doesn't, it doesn't, there's a starting point, ending point. And so these it's things where I'm always kind of, I'll probe her, you know, the opposite, this opposite, that. And then the point is also for, I'm always want to have to like generalize one level up, like find a genus. Obviously I won't use the word genus, you know, but, uh, but I'll say when we, like the hot cold, I'll say, what is, what's the word that describes both of them? How do we know what, how can we group them? And then she'll, and then she'll say something like temperature, right? Something like that. So I think the opposite game is really good. And then on top of it, I wanted, I wanted to kind of group it. I think that's really important to at least put a name to it. Um, I think there's another game that I played with her for a while now. We call it, the, we actually call it the grouping game. And one example that I gave her is this. I said, um, how would you group an ambulance, a police car, and a Toyota Camry? You know, Cause uh, my grandfather had a Camry. What? I a asked what? her how she, a Toyota, Cam Toyota Camry, a Camry, a Camry car. Yeah. Toyota, Camry. Toyota, a Toyota, Toyota, Toyota. Uh -huh. Yes. So how would she group the ambulance, the police car and the Toyota Camry? And at first she said kind of the more perceptual, right? That the police car and the Camry are both cars and the ambulance, it's more of a truck shape. And I asked her to think, I'm like, what is another way that you can group them that make me even more important than just kind of the shape? And then she thought about it and she says, well, the ambulance and the police car. And I said, why do those go together? And she says, well, they're, they're helper cars. They help you, right? And I thought that was really cool, right? So she contrasted the helper cars versus the non-helper car. And then I would actually point out, and then I actually wanted her to, to I want her to see some deduction there. So I actually, I'm like, well, what happens if I, what would you call a fire truck? And she's like, that's a helper car too. And then I'm like, what would you call a Tesla? She's like, that's not a helper car, right? And I think that's, and I've always kind of played these games with their, um, in a sense that I'm always kind of probing her knowledge, seeing if I go too far. Like I can tell if she's kind of kind of stumped on something. The other thing is, I think I, I'm actually at a difficult time with is, is gauging, is her gauging her own emotion. Um, I've asked her a couple of times if she understands something. She's actually gotten defensive. Um, she's like, I don't want to talk about it. It's interesting. I don't know if other people have had that. I mean, maybe it's just the level of maturity, her age. Um, I'm actually had more successful logical games than kind of emotional games. Uh, maybe that's just my own emphasis as being, as being an objective. We tend to hone in on, on, on logic and, and finding similarities in words. And then the other thing that I was really interesting, because we always, I was kind of probed around on different names of things. And she's like, Dad, why, why do we have words? What do words mean? Like, where do we, like, why do we use words as opposed to something else? And I said, well, imagine this. This is what I, I mean, I'm just winging it. I'm not a philosopher. Maybe here you come me out here and give me something better. I said, imagine if every time you saw this four-legged thing that wags its tail and barks, and it's different color, and then you saw another four-legged thing and wags its tail and it barks, but now it's big and, and, and dark brown versus light gray. We need a we need something that, that can unify them. It's just easier to say that's a dog, right? So you just name it. And she's like, oh, that makes sense now. So it's I don't know if that's necessarily the right thing, but it's just there's certain things like that where we have this kind of dialogue, and uh, even when I'm like working on some curriculum with her, they're going through things. I always kind of, I'll probe 
like knowledge, this and that. I'm like, I want to always make sure she's tethered to her thinking, her concepts, or at least to her, relative to her level, of course. But that she's that she's make sense. That she can make sense of what we're doing. And we have these kind of that, and that's the kind of the way I do it. Um, you know, I I like to think she's pretty advanced at her age, but that's you know just in the sense of <clears throat> having me kind of psychopistemologically going back and forth with her and probing her knowledge, and then she'll ask me. But she'll actually throw the opposite game back at me. She's like, can you name opposites? And she, so it's interesting how we have that. Um, there's a lot of things that, that you, you guys were mentioning and I can, I can definitely see, um, you know, how, how it develops in a, in, a, in a young mind. It's just really interesting to see that she gets older. Now, are you aware that you mixed categories there when you said a Camry and an ambulance, that those are not parallel? Was that okay? Well, they're vehicles. They're all they're in the category. A Camry of is a kind of Toyota, which oh. is a kind oh. of car. Oh, and so uh, you know, you'd have to name a kind of ambulance uh, and a kind of fire truck. So why didn't you go to a car like that and point to one? Oh, uh, grandfather you. had a Camry, so we just we just knew. You know, we just the car she, she knew was just a car. It was it was an example. Yeah, I could have gone more general. But, but, but she, see, understood. she understood. It's not parallel. So you add an extra complexity, in, which is, you know, not a deadly thing to do, but just be aware of that. Yes, that's true. It's, it probably could have done a more, a more general thing. But the, but, the, but the essential is kind of the same, right? So that you can see the difference between the different types of vehicles and, and what they do. And I think that was kind of the point I was trying to make. Uh-huh. Then you could go to um, a car and a boat. Yeah, so that's the next the, the next level, right? So she yes, yeah, so, so, and then you could kind of as we get older, I'd imagine I can you know kind of probe her with more abstract concepts right yeah. now. It's but it's but the same but the same in principle it's the same method, right? I think it's just finding the genus, the next level up. I always want her to kind of go to the next level. Yeah, up that's correct. Think. That's a good policy. It's like a standing right. order. Right? Anywhere, always yeah. always go higher, one level. Yeah, that was Ayn Rand's principle. So Jeff, uh, I was wondering if she, you know, I talked last week about what I think is the importance of inklings, feelings about thoughts, the the, the you know the connection between emotions and thinking, and that uh, you see the problem is that I think it, the introspection, and let me just say what I mean by introspection is primarily the conceptual identification of what's going on in your conscious mind. Now, there, there is some other things that there's a broader notion of what introspection is that's more uh, closer to being perception. But I think in the most fundamental sense, it's a form of thinking. The genus, the genus of introspection is thinking. And then it's conceptual identification of, of, of your thought processes, what's going on in your mind. Um, but you don't want to be doing that all the time. There's a kind of interweaving as you're thinking about anything between extrospection and introspection. And the default is extrospection. You know, you're thinking about the world. That's the primary thing. And, you know, you can't spend your whole life introspecting. You don't want to do that. Uh, for, for one thing, you will end up in the well like that philosopher that fell into the well. If you just, you know, introspecting all the time while you're walking down the street. Uh, but you, you know, want to do it appropriately and, and, the inklings give you feelings about thoughts, give you some, some uh, indicators of when you should be stepping back, taking stepping back for a moment and thinking about, you know, what's, what's going on here. What's, what's the key concept that I ought to be spending uh, more, some more time uh, thinking about what's slipping by too quickly in my mind. Uh, these are introspective type questions. I mentioned, I was going to mention some of those uh, today, uh, but you, you know, you, you want to be asking those things at the appropriate time. So I'm wondering, does she have any notion at all at this age of a feeling like, uh, you know, the rock in your shoe when you when you don't quite understand something, you know, when you read, you're reading something or you're listening to something and it's not quite hanging together, doesn't quite integrate. You get this feeling. So I like to call it a rock in a shoe as is the best analogy I can give. And does she have any uh, experience of those or understanding of those at this point yet? Yeah, it's. I mean, it's. It's a little. It's probably a little early uh, to, to yeah. for her to be at least explicit of it. But implicitly, I think I do think she has a sense of of um, of something. So, like, for example, um, in some lessons that that I work with, a little bit passage, and I can tell you know because she has that like kind of blank look on her face. 
And I was like, did you understand everything? And she'll, and she'll look at me and she says, kind of. And I said, are, are there certain, like, and I'll go through certain words. I'll actually help. I'll reread something to her and I'll actually point to her um, if we're on the, on the computer or something. And I'll say, do you think this is a keyword? And then she'll say, no, no. And then eventually like, I'll kind of, kind of tip it off that this is an important, important word. So I mean, I, if that's what you mean, then eventually she'll pick yeah. up that, that word and that helps her, right? So um, she, at this point, she probably needs a little bit more handholding, um, you know, at this age, but I'm hoping, you know, as time goes on, of course, she'll, she'll mature enough and get those inklings on her own. At least she can pinpoint where there's uncertainty and not just that there is uncertainty, but kind of isolate where it is. Right now, I think it's just more a general sense of uncertainty and that she needs kind of guidance in, in kind of isolating where that is and where that lies. Uh-huh. Yeah, I I've think that, a, oh, go ahead, Bill, uh, Bob, and I'm, I've got another comment, but go ahead, Bob. Well, I've got a question relating to this. Uh, do you tease her? <laughs> tease in, in, what, in what sense? Like um, Tell something that is obviously untrue and she catches you at it. Um, maybe when we were younger, but now I think we, not, not, not that much, actually, not that I can think of. Yeah. That might be a good thing to do just because uh, uh, there's a lot of, in the world, there's a lot of what Bob's calling teasing going on in the world. People are trying to convince you of things, you know, every day, more or less badly. And so, you know, intellectual self-defense is a, is a major skill, and, uh, especially in our society, you know, these days. So, you know, when, when you can start, I don't know what age to start doing that. Of course, you don't want to subvert her intelligence uh, by, getting her afraid that everything in the world is wrong, but some, some amount of what, what Bob's calling teasing might be good. Here's a good example, actually, now that, now that you kind of uh, cleared up for me a little bit. So we, um, we, did a, we were doing some math problems yesterday, and I use um, Singapore math. I don't know if you've, if you've heard of that. It's a, it's a very conceptually based uh, math curriculum, and I, I, I love it. I think it's, I would recommend it to all you know, parents. I think it goes up to like pre-K up to fifth grade. Um, so we were doing some problems, and... Um, you know, she had to come up with the number of like, so they'd give the number of tens and ones and you'd have to get the number. So the, the, they'd ask like three questions in a row. They'd be like three tens and four ones equals what? Five tens and two ones equals it. And then they would, and then for the, like the fourth one in a row, they would say four ones and five tens is what? And she would, and she would actually start to write the answer. And she'd look at me and she's like, wait a second. They're and I'm like, are they I'm like, notice the last question. What are they doing? She's like, they're trying to trick me. <laughs> she's like, but I'm not going to be tricked. And she kind of, she started writing the answer, like just kind of like following the, the, the pattern, the, the, the first three and then the fourth one, she picked, she picked it up. And she's like, I'm not, I'm not going to be tricked. And I'm like, see, and I'm like, and I was really proud. I was like happy that she kind of sensed that. But if that's what, if that's, that's what you mean, Bob, that was one example that, that kind of just came to my mind. Did, did she oh. said, wait a second. Yeah. She said, wait a sec. She started to write Great. kind of just in the same pattern, but then she stopped herself as she was writing kind of, she would have got it wrong, of course, because she was going to do the, she, mixed, she would have inverted the, the tens and the ones, but then she that, stopped herself. That wait a second is, is a very uh, good comment to make, you know, to, for her to realize yes, that, what, that a focused mind has to, slowness is the essence of focus in a certain sense. Uh, you know, you have to, I mean, not, I mean, in the sense of, of sometimes you have to slow your thinking down so that things don't slip by too quickly. And if, and if she can realize that at her age, that's great. That's tremendous. And I'll tell her, don't rush. Like anytime we start something, I always emphasize, take your time. I, I know Harry's mentioned that Ayn Rand would spend how, how much, how long would you spend reading a page or something? But, but just the, the point is just to slow down and just, there's no rush. Just, just think through things. Right. And I'll always remind her of that. Um, you know, I think that's really important with, with young children. So. A lot of times, slower is faster. If you if you if you rush through material, and by the way, comprehension, reading comprehension, and uh, comprehension of, of speech, is an excellent domain for for learning these psychopathological skills because comprehension comes up every, every day for almost everybody, and you always have opportunities to identify some key concepts or you know, ideas that are, that go by too quickly and that you need to focus on and learn how to identify those things. So comprehension is a very good uh, venue uh, for, for training this stuff. Let me add something, uh, three somethings. Um, yes, that's that, wait a minute, is very important in three respects. One is you have the power to pause, to hold, to stop, to not just go on to the next thing that occurs to you. 
You have that control over your mind. That's an important thing to know. Second, if that was an inkling, how did you know to say, wait a minute, something didn't feel right about what you were thinking, right? About what he said. You got to learn to be sensitive to that. You tell her, but maybe not sensitive. Watch out for that feeling. When you have that feeling, it's like an alarm signal going off. There may be a fire somewhere. You have to, you know, so I would go with the inkling um, uh, by that example. And the third thing is that when you do wait a minute, you don't just, you know, mm -hmm. you have the power to zoom in. This she needs to know. You could show her with the camera or something. You, you, uh, your, your iPhone, you know, you spread with the, the spreading motion, zoom in. And that is an essential, the two, two essential operations are zooming in and panning back. And we've been talking about panning back. Well, what else is there? You know, what's the opposite? What, what are they two together as opposed to a third thing? But there's also zoom in less material in your mind. You can look at parts of it. You can look at aspects of it. You can look at where it came from. You can just repeat it over again. Uh, but mainly you break it down in some way to make a simpler problem when you can find out what went wrong. And this is, well, you know, it surprised me when I began to use computers in 1980 that repairing a computer, fixing it, you know, was a matter of finding out which part had failed and then just getting a, a replacement for that. Like memory chips failed a lot. So you had to learn which memory chip on the board needed to be replaced with a new memory chip and you would pull it out and put a new memory chip in. And you didn't attempt to get, you know, you think of repair as well, I have to heat it up or, or melt it down and then rewire it. No, you find the part, you isolate, isolation, differentiation to isolate, so that your mind has this power. It's like a super important lesson. Yeah, it's very important uh, also because of the phenomenon of automatization. Things get automated and your intentions, as, as a skill gets automated, like driving is the classic skill, your, the intentions you need to execute the skill become more and more general. But in order for you to go beyond what you've automated, you have to get specific. You have to go the other way. Otherwise, you know, if you want to get past and, and we don't, nobody has everything automated perfectly so that, uh, you know, you don't need to do this. You need to uh, get specific. And that's what free will or volitional attention is about. When I was teaching at Hunter, I learned a, an object lesson in that I would teach genus and differentia for definition. And I'd write G-E-N-U-S on the board and D-I-F-F-E-R-E-N-T-I-A. And uh, I would ask them, you know, in essay questions on the quizzes, to some question where they had to write differential and half of them wrote differential and half of them wrote difference. I mean, no, a, a, an eighth of them wrote difference. So then I realized what's going on in their minds rather than looking, and this is a funny word. This is what I would, this is a funny word. Oh, for gen, genus, of course they wrote genius, right? <laughs> But what the yeah. proper thing is, you'd look closer, you'd stop. Well, wait a minute, differential, that's funny. What's funny? D-I-F-F's not funny. Oh, the ending, it ends in just hanging in an I-A. must be a foreign word. And the genus, what genus? Oh, there's no I in it for genius. It's like genius <laughs> without the... So you, you zoom in, you break it down. And their attitude, if you can see me, if you're a hope on video, their attitude is they're looking around. And if you do that, that's another experiment. You know, you can, if you look around, you don't see what's there. If you look, oh, there's that. 
and there's that, and there's that, you know, that's observation as opposed to just a mental stew, things swim by, and that's the thing to be avoided. I've got a question for you, Harry. When you were talking about the games earlier, I think you covered virtually every one of the uh, first level concepts of consciousness, you know, perception and feeling and imagination. And you hinted at evaluation, but I didn't catch what your game was that had to do with that. Um, I didn't, I had one, which is pick your favorite. And then I think it's very important to get them the idea that people and they should have a top value, a favorite, and that other people have different ones that you may, may puzzle you, you know, repel you, but that you, you need to have favorites in every category. You know, what's your favorite story? What's your favorite dessert? What's your favorite kind of potatoes? And they should identify that for themselves. And that will change their whole evaluation method. And so, and you can point out, so we can, what's your second most favorite? And you can get the idea of as a ranking of things above each other. Money would be good for that too. That's teleological measurement uh, to show them some things are worth a dime and some things are worth a quarter. And uh, the dime is smaller, you know, these coins are going out of use, but the dime is smaller than the nickel, but it's worth more. Get them to chew on that for a while. How can that be? Harry, can I ask you like a general question? What do you think of, um, in terms of ranking, like a lot of times what I'll ask my daughter is, I, give me out of 10, what do you want to do the most? Like, and she kind of, uh, you know, eight, nine, do you think that, do you think that serves an important yeah. purpose? Yeah, but it is also good to, to identify which one is on top because you have to make choices in life and you, you have to put your top value ahead of everything and be committed to that uh, in, or else you fritter away your life. I got well, some super just, chats. I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Jeff. No, I was just saying it's not just the precise quantification, but it's the it's the top value. It's the it's the it's the it's the order that is not that yeah. is important. It's not just the quantification. The relation of them and that one of them is at the top, and that's what I should go after and think about. Those things okay. have political political implications because that uh, developing that reasoning will help you avoid egalitarianism in your thought yeah, process. That's true. Yep. It's true. We got so, go ahead, Steve. So two su uh, super chats, one from Apollo Seuss, and he just says, cutting edge with an exclamation point. He loves the show. I, I, well, I thank surmise. you. Yeah, thanks, Apollo Zeus. Yeah. And then we got one from jo Jonathan Honig, and there's no com That's comment. Oh, so okay. Thank you, Jonathan. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks, Jonathan. And, and I'd like to add, so, so Simon sa says here, I have experience te teaching that. Kids love it. It's more of a group, you know, ga game. So uh, it could it could be used uh, in small groups, I guess. And then there's M M Mother May I. Yes. And, and then there's also Buzz, like a number. Yes. And I got the I, I got these from a post from HB Le Letter. This from fantastic. Uh, new, newsletter on the internet, hbletter.com. So those are the ones that I remember from the post. Okay, go yeah, ahead. The game of buzz is really challenging uh, where it's two kids and one of them says a number, the other one says the next number, one, two, three, four, five. But if the number has a seven in it or is divisible by seven, you don't say the number, you say buzz. So it should go like this, one, two, three, four, five, six, buzz, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, buzz, 15, six. And it's challenging. Of course, you have to know multiplication tables up to 100 or uh, up to some number that you play to. Yeah, I never, I didn't hear of that game. I, I when, when uh, Steve, when you said it, 
uh, what came into my mind is that maybe it's some kind of beer drinking game. Ah. Now, if you're beer drinking, you can't do it. <laughs> yeah, right. That's right. I learned it at camp. Okay, well, we're we're at the top of the hour. Should we? Are there any other questions, or do, do we want to? Uh, well, Jeff, start? you got something you want to end up with us with? Tell tell us a nice a, a good fact about your your young Emma that you haven't told us yet. Well, she's um, she's a big fan of Elon Musk. She loves uh, SpaceX. She loves uh, rocket right? ships. Yeah, she's um, definitely not a she never was into dolls. I don't know. It was interesting. She loves sports. She plays softball, soccer, um, building, Legos. Um, you know, a lot of times I've used Legos as like uh, an instructional tool. I was like, in terms of just like hierarchy, I would actually point out to her, I'm like, you couldn't start on step 89, could you, right? If you're going to build a Lego set. So I was just always kind of going back and forth. And, and I was just kind of just throwing in my my two cents there, but just trying to get her aware of kind of hierarchy in, in that, in the sense of her. But yeah, she's very much into building and, and playing. So we'll see how that um it unfolds she gets older oh another Maybe. thing before you sign off memorization is very good people uh are opposed to memorization in education but that only applies at the very high, you know like almost college level there has to be a lot of autom automatizing of basic knowledge at the earlier levels like the at, or what arithmetic comes out with including multiplication tables yeah. Uh, poems, mem memorizing poems conditions your mind to use well grammar. <laughs> well grammar. Pret prettily grammar. Uh, yeah. <laughs> something like that, yeah. yeah. Now I, even I would celebrate in rhymes inept the great immortal Syracuse and rivaled nevermore who by his wondrous lore untold us before made the way straight how to circles mensurate. That was 30 decimal places of pi, by the way. That was a rhyme for 30 decimal places of pi. Really? Yeah. Each The number of letters in each uh, word is the, chorus, is the, is the oh. digit, the corresponding decimal place. And fortunately, there are no zeros in the first 30 places. Oh. It's a silly rhyme, but... Uh, no, I thought it was high literature. Yeah. Harry, would you say memorization is, is important, not as an end in itself, but as a means maybe to, to enhance working memory or something like that, where you can free up, the more you can automatize, the more, the more ability you oh, have to solve complex problems? It's, it's good in so many ways. It gives you a knowledge base that's there effortlessly. It shows you how to control your mind. And that one of the things I had was that you tell them, you can remember things by repeating them over and over again, or you can make associations, which is, you know, I would let them to repeat for a while. You make associations because your memory is kind of like a net or something they understand that way, where one string leads to another. And the more strings or roads that, that go to a piece, the easier it is to find it. And there are other, you know, how much you care about it. So tell them what accounts for their memory and teach them to memorize both for the content and the method. Okay, I guess it's about time for us to go over to, uh, to cl the clubhouse, uh, those who uh, will want to do so. And I, I do want to thank both Harry and Jeff, who are, who are I thought, tremendously good uh, guests. And uh, well, let's go over to, shall we go over to Clubhouse, Steve? Why don't you end sounds, up for it? Sounds great. Lee, uh, Daniel, we'll, we'll uh, call it a wrap. Thanks, everybody.